Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot. Adjust your volume. Take a nice deep breath in. Let it out slowly. And off we go. This evening, let's continue our exploration of the fascinating world of the bee with more from The Hive and the Honey Bee, A Beekeeper's Manual by Rev. L. L. Langstroth, first published in 1853 by Hopkins Bridgman and Company, Northampton, Massachusetts. Let's pick up right where we left off in the middle of Chapter 3 and the description of the different kinds of bee in the hive. Let's begin. The extraordinary fertility of the queen bee has already been noticed. The process of laying has been well described by the Reverend W. Dunbar, a Scotch apiarian. Quote, When the queen is about to lay, she puts her head into a cell and remains in that position for a second or two to ascertain its fitness for the deposit which she is about to make. She then withdraws her head and, curving her body downwards, inserts the lower part of it into the cell. In a few seconds, she turns half round upon herself and withdraws, leaving an egg behind her. When she lays a considerable number, she does it equally on each side of the comb those on the one side being as exactly opposite to those on the other as the relative position of the cells will admit. The effect of this is to produce the utmost possible concentration and economy of heat for developing the various changes of the brood. End quote. Here, as at every step in the economy of the bee, our minds are filled with admiration as we witness the perfect adaptation of means to ends. Who can blame the warmest enthusiasm of the apiarian in view of a sagacity which seems scarcely inferior to that of man? The eggs of bees, I quote from the admirable treatise of Bevan, are of a lengthened oval shape with a slight curvature and of a bluish-white color being besmeared at the time of laying with a glutinous substance. They adhere to the bases of the cells and remain unchanged in figure or situation for three or four days. They are then hatched, the bottom of each cell presenting to view a small white worm. On its growing so as to touch the opposite angle of the cell, it coils itself up to use the language of Swammerdam, like a dog when going to sleep, and floats in a whitish transparent fluid, which is deposited in the cells by the nursing bees, and by which it is probably nourished. It becomes gradually enlarged in its dimensions, till the two extremities touch one another and form a ring. In this state it is called a larva or worm, so nicely do the bees calculate the quantity of food which will be required that none remains in the cell when it is transformed to a nymph. It is the opinion of many eminent naturalists that farina does not constitute the sole food of the larva, but that it consists of a mixture of farina, honey, and water, partly digested in the stomachs of the nursing bees. The larva, having derived its support in the manner above described, for four, five, or six days according to the season, the development being retarded in cool weather and badly protected hives, continues to increase during that period, 
till it occupies the whole breadth and nearly the length of the cell. The nursing bees now seal over the cell with a light brown cover, externally more or less convex, the cap of a drone cell being more convex than that of a worker, and thus differing from that of a honey cell, which is paler and somewhat concave. The cap of the brood cell appears to be made of a mixture of bee bread and wax. It is not airtight, as it would be if made of wax alone, but when examined with a microscope, it appears to be reticulated or full of fine holes through which the enclosed insect can have air for all necessary purposes. From its texture and shape, it is easily thrust off by the bee when mature, whereas if it consisted wholly of wax, the young bee would either perish for a lack of air or be unable to force its way into the world. Both the material and shape of the lids which seal up the honey cells are different because an entirely different object was aimed at. They are of pure wax to make them airtight and thus to prevent the honey from souring or candying in the cells. They are concave or hollowed inwards to give them greater strength to resist the pressure of their contents. To return to Bevan, the larva is no sooner perfectly enclosed than it begins to line the cell by spinning round itself after the manner of the silkworm, a whitish silky film or cocoon by which it is encased as it were in a pod. When it has undergone this change, it has usually borne the name of nymph or pupa. The insect has now attained its full growth. The working bee nymph spins its cocoon in 36 hours. After passing about three days in this state of preparation for a new existence, it gradually undergoes so great a change as not to wear a vestige of its previous form but becomes armed with a firmer male and with scales of a dark brown hue. On its belly, six rings become distinguishable, which by slipping one over another enables the bee to shorten its body whenever it has occasion to do so. When it has reached the 21st day of its existence, counting from the moment the egg is laid, it comes forth a perfect winged insect. The cocoon is left behind and forms a closely attached and exact lining to the cell in which it was spun. By this means, the breeding cells become smaller and their partitions stronger the oftener they change their tenants and may become so much diminished in size as not to admit of the perfect development of full-sized bees. Such are the respective stages of the working bee. Those of the royal bee are as follows. She passes three days in the egg and is five a worm. The workers then close her cell and she immediately begins spinning her cocoon, which occupies her 24 hours. On the tenth and eleventh days, and a part of the twelfth, as if exhausted by her labor, she remains in complete repose. Then she passes four days, and a part of the fifth, as a nymph. It is on the sixteenth day, therefore, that the perfect state of queen is attained. The drone passes three days in the egg, six and a half as a worm, and changes into a perfect insect on the 24th or 25th day after the egg is laid. The development of each species likewise proceeds more slowly when the colonies are weak or the air cool, and when the weather is very cold, it is entirely suspended. Dr. Hunter has observed that the eggs, worms, and nymphs all require a heat above 70 degrees of Fahrenheit for their evolution.
In the chapter on protection against extremes of heat and cold, I have dwelt at some length upon the importance of constructing the hives in such a manner as to enable the bees to preserve, as far as possible, a uniform temperature in their tenement. In thin hives exposed to the sun, the heat is sometimes so great as to destroy the eggs and the larvae, even when the combs escape from being melted, and the cold is often so severe as to check the development of the brood and sometimes to kill it outright. In such hives, when the temperature out of doors falls suddenly and severely, the bees at once feel the unfavorable change. They are obliged in self-defense to huddle together to keep warm, and thus large portions of the brood comb are often abandoned, and the brood either destroyed at once by the cold, or so enfeebled that they never recover from the shock. Let every beekeeper, in all his operations, remember that brood comb must never be exposed to a low temperature so as to become chilled. The disastrous effects are almost as certain as when the eggs of a setting hen are left for too long a time by the careless mother. The brood combs are never safe when taken for any considerable time from the bees unless the temperature is fully up to summer heat. The young bees break their envelope with their teeth and assisted as soon as they come forth by the older ones, proceed to cleanse themselves from the moisture and exuviae with which they were surrounded. Both drones and workers on emerging from the cell are at first gray, soft, and comparatively helpless, so that some time elapses before they take wing. With respect to the cocoons spun by the different larvae, both workers and drones spin complete cocoons or enclose themselves on every side. Royal larvae construct only imperfect cocoons, open behind and enveloping only the head, thorax, and first ring of the abdomen. And Huber concludes without any hesitation that the final cause of their forming only incomplete cocoons is that they may thus be exposed to the mortal sting of the first hatched queen, whose instinct leads her instantly to seek the destruction of those who would soon become her rivals. If the royal larvae spun complete cocoons, the stings of the queen seeking to destroy their rivals might be so entangled in their meshes that they could not be disengaged. Such, says Huber, is the instinctive enmity of young queens to each other, that I have seen one of them, immediately on its emergence from the cell, rush to those of its sisters and tear to pieces even the imperfect larvae. Hitherto philosophers have claimed our admiration of nature for her care in preserving and multiplying the species. But from these facts, we must now admire her precautions in exposing certain individuals to a mortal hazard. The cocoon of the royal larva is very much stronger and coarser than that spun by the drone or worker, its texture considerably resembling that of the silkworms. The young queen does not come forth from her cell until she is quite mature, and as its great size gives her abundant room to exercise her wings, she is capable of flying as soon as she quits it. While still in her cell, she makes the fluttering and piping noises with which every observant beekeeper is so well acquainted. Some apiarians have supposed that the queen bee has the power to regulate the development of eggs in her ovaries, so that few or many are produced according to the necessities of the colony. This is evidently a mistake. Her eggs, 
like those of the domestic hen, are formed without any volition of her own, and when fully developed must be extruded. If the weather is unfavorable, or if the colony is too feeble to maintain sufficient heat, a smaller number of eggs are developed in her ovaries, just as unfavorable circumstances diminish the number of eggs laid by the hen. If the weather is very cold, egg-laying usually ceases altogether. In the latitude of Philadelphia, I opened one of my hives on the fifth day of February and found an abundance of eggs and brood, although the winter had been an unusually cold one and the temperature of the preceding month very low. The fall of 1852 was a warm one, and eggs and brood were found in a hive which I examined on the 21st of October. Powerful stocks in well-protected hives contain some brood, at least ten months in the year. In the warm countries, bees probably breed every month in the year. It is highly interesting to see in what way the supernumerary eggs of the queen are disposed of, when the number of workers is too small to take charge of all her eggs, or when there is a deficiency of bee bread to nourish the young, or when, for any reason, she judges it not best to deposit them in cells, she stands upon a comb and simply extrudes them from her oviduct, and the workers devour them as fast as they are laid. This I have repeatedly witnessed in my observing hives, and admire the sagacity of the queen in economizing her necessary work after this fashion, instead of laboriously depositing the eggs in cells where they are not wanted. What a difference between her wise management and the stupidity of a hen, obstinately persisting to set upon addled eggs or pieces of chalk, and often upon nothing at all. The workers eat up also all the eggs which are dropped or deposited out of place by the queen. In this way, nothing goes to waste, and even a tiny egg is turned to some account. Was there ever a better comment upon the maxim, take care of the pence, and the pounds will take care of themselves? Do the workers who appear to be so fond of a tidbit in the shape of a new laid egg ever experience a struggle between their appetites and the claims of duty, and does it cost them some self-denial to refrain from making a breakfast on a fresh laid egg? It is really very difficult for one who has carefully watched the habits of bees to speak of his little favorites in any other way than as though they possessed an intelligence, almost, if not quite, akin to reason. It is well known to every breeder of poultry that the fertility of a hen decreases with age until at length she becomes entirely barren. It is equally certain that the fertility of the queen bee ordinarily diminishes after she has entered upon her third year. She sometimes ceases to lay worker eggs, a considerable time before she dies of old age. The contents of the spermatheca are exhausted, the eggs can no longer be impregnated, and must therefore produce drones. The queen bee usually dies of old age, sometime in her fourth year, although instances are on record of some having survived a year longer. It is highly important to the beekeeper, who would receive the largest returns from his bees, to be able, as in my hives, to catch the queen and remove her when she has passed the period of her greatest fertility. In the sequel, full directions will be given as to the proper time and mode of effecting it. Before proceeding farther in the natural history of the queen bee, 
I shall describe more particularly the other inmates of the hive. The drones, or male bees. The drones are unquestionably the male bees. Dissection proves that they have the appropriate organs of generation. They are much larger and stouter than either the queen or workers, although their bodies are not quite so long as that of the queen. They have no sting with which to defend themselves, no proboscis which is suitable for gathering honey from the flowers, and no baskets on their thighs for holding the bee bread. They are thus physically disqualified for work, even if they were ever so well disposed to it. Their proper office is to impregnate the young queens, and they are usually destroyed by the bees soon after this is completed. Dr. Evans, the author of a beautiful poem on bees, thus appropriately describes them. Their short proboscis sips, no luscious nectar from the wild thyme's lips. From the lime's leaf no amber drops they steal, nor bear their grooveless thighs the foodful meal. On others' toils in pampered leisure thrive, the lazy fathers of the industrious hive. The drones begin to make their appearance in April or May, earlier or later, according to climate and the forwardness of the season. They require about 24 days for their full development from the egg. In colonies which are too weak to swarm, none, as a general rule, are reared. They are not needed, for in such hives, as no young queens are raised, they would be only useless consumers. The number of drones in a hive is often very great, amounting not merely to hundreds, but sometimes to thousands. It seems at first very difficult to understand why there should be so many, especially since it has been ascertained that a single one will impregnate a queen for life. But as intercourse always takes place high in the air, the young queens are obliged to leave the hive for this purpose, and it is exceedingly important to their safety that they should be sure of finding one without being compelled to make frequent excursions. Being larger than a worker and less quick on the wing, they are more exposed to be caught by birds or blown down and destroyed by sudden gusts of wind. In a large apiary, a few drones in each hive, or the number usually found in one, might be amply sufficient. But it must be borne in mind that under these circumstances, bees are not in a state of nature. Before they were domesticated, a colony living in a forest often had no neighbors for miles. Now a good stock in our climate sometimes sends out three or more swarms, and in the tropical climates of which the bee is a native, they increase with astonishing rapidity. At Sydney in Australia, a single colony is stated to have multiplied to 300 in three years. All the new swarms except the first are let off by a young queen, and as she is never impregnated until after she has been established as the head of a separate family, it is important that they should all be accompanied by a goodly number of drones, and this renders it necessary that a large number should be produced in the parent hive. As this necessity no longer exists, when the bee is domesticated, the production of so many drones should be discouraged. Traps have been invented to destroy them, but it is much better to save the bees the labor and expense of rearing such a host of useless consumers. This can readily be done by the use of my hives. The cells in which the drones are reared 
are much larger than those appropriated to the raising of workers. The combs containing them may be taken out to have their places supplied with worker cells, and thus the overproduction of drones may easily be prevented. Some colonies contain so much drone comb as to be nearly worthless. I have no doubt that some of my readers will object to this mode of management as interfering with nature, but let them remember that the bee is not in a state of nature, and that the same objection might be urged against killing off the supernumerary males of our domestic animals. In July or August, soon after the swarming season is over, the bees expel the drones from the hive. They sometimes sting them, and sometimes gnaw the roots of their wings, so that when driven from the hive they cannot return. If not treated in either of these summary ways, they are so persecuted and starved that they soon perish. The hatred of the bees extends even to the young which are still unhatched. They are mercilessly pulled from the cells and destroyed with the rest. How wonderful that instinct, which teaches the bees that there is no longer any occasion for the services of the drones, and which impels them to destroy those members of the colony, which a short time before they reared with such devoted attention. A colony which neglects to expel its drones at the usual season ought always to be examined. The queen is probably either diseased or dead. In my hives, such an examination may be easily made, the true state of the case ascertained, and the proper remedies at once applied. See Chapter on the Loss of the Queen The production of so many drones necessary in a state of nature to prevent degeneracy from in and in breeding. I have often been able, by the reasons previously assigned, to account for the necessity of such a large number of drones in a state of nature to the satisfaction of others but never fully to my own. I have repeatedly queried why impregnation might not just as well have been effected in the hive as on the wing in the open air. Two very obvious and highly important advantages would have resulted from such an arrangement. First, a few dozen drones would have amply sufficed for the wants of the colony even if, as in tropical climates, it swarmed half a dozen times or oftener in the same season. Second, the young queens would have been exposed to none of those risks which they now incur in leaving the hive for fecundation. I was unable to show how the existing arrangement is best, although I never doubted that there must be a satisfactory reason for this seeming imperfection. To support otherwise would be highly unphilosophical, since we constantly see, as the circle of our knowledge is enlarged, many mysteries in nature hitherto inexplicable fully cleared up. Let me here ask if the disposition which too many students of nature cherish to reject some of the doctrines of revealed religion is not equally unphilosophical. Neither our ignorance of all the facts necessary to their full elucidation, nor our inability to harmonize these facts in their mutual relations and dependencies, will justify us in rejecting any truth which God has seen fit to reveal, either in the book of nature or in his holy word. The man who would substitute his own speculations for the divine teachings has embarked without rudder or chart, pilot or compass, 
upon the uncertain ocean of theory and conjecture. Unless he turns his prow from its fatal course, no sun of righteousness will ever brighten for him the dreary expanse of waters. Storms and whirlwinds will thicken in gloom on his voyage of life, and no favoring gales will ever waft his shattered bark to a peaceful haven. The thoughtful reader will require no apology for the moralizing strain of many of my remarks, nor blame a clergyman if forgetting sometimes to speak as the mere naturalist. He endeavors to find tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in bees, and God in everything. To return to the point from which I have digressed, a new attempt to account for the existence of so many drones. If a farmer persists in what is called breeding in and in, that is, from the same stock without changing the blood, it is well known that a rapid degeneracy is the inevitable consequence. This law extends, as far as we know, to all animal life, and even man is not exempt from its influence. Have we any reason to suppose that the bee is an exception, or that ultimate degeneracy would not ensue unless some provision was made to counteract the tendency to in and in breeding? If fecundation had taken place in the hive, the queen bee must of necessity have been impregnated by drones from a common parent, and the same result must have taken place in each successive generation, until the whole species would eventually have run out. By the present arrangement, the young females, when they leave the hive, often find the air swarming with drones, many of which belong to other colonies and thus by crossing the breed, a provision is constantly made to prevent deterioration. Experience has proved not only that it is unnecessary to impregnation, that there should be drones in the colony of the young queen, but that this may be effected even when there are no drones in the apiary, and none except at some considerable distance. Intercourse takes place very high in the air. Perhaps that less risk may be incurred from birds, and this is the more favorable to the continual crossing of stocks. I am strongly persuaded that the decay of many flourishing stocks, even when managed with great care, is to be attributed to the fact that they have become enfeebled by close breeding and are thus unable to resist the injurious influences, which were comparatively harmless when the bees were in a state of high physical vigor. The Workers, or Common Bees The number of workers in a hive varies very much. A good swarm ought to contain 15 or 20,000 bees, and in large hives, Strong colonies which are not reduced by swarming frequently number two or three times as many during the height of the breeding season. We have well-authenticated instances of stocks much more populous than this. The Polish hives will hold several bushels, and yet we are informed by Mr. Doagost that they swarm regularly and that the swarms are so powerful that they resemble a little cloud in the air. I shall hereafter consider how the size of the hive affects the number of bees that it may be expected to produce. The workers, as has been already stated, are all females whose ovaries are too imperfectly developed to admit of their laying eggs. For a long time, they were regarded as neither males nor females, and were called neuters, but more careful microscopic examinations have enabled us to detect the rudiments of their ovaries 
and thus to determine their sex. The accuracy of these examinations has been verified by the well-known facts respecting fertile workers. Rehm, a German apiarian, first discovered that workers sometimes lay eggs. Huber, in the course of his investigations on this subject, ascertained that such workers were raised in hives that had lost their queen and in the vicinity of the royal cells in which young queens were being reared. He conjectured that they received accidentally a small portion of the peculiar food of these infant queens, and in this way he accounted for their reproductive organs being more developed than those of other workers. Workers reared in such hives are in close proximity to the young queens, and there is certainly much probability that some of the royal jelly may be accidentally dropped into their cells, as in these hives, the queen cells when first commenced are parallel to the horizon instead of being perpendicular to it, as they are in other hives. I do not feel confident, however, that they are not sometimes bred in hives which have not lost their queen. The kind of eggs laid by these fertile workers has already been noticed. Such workers are seldom tolerated in hives containing a fertile, healthy queen, though instances of this kind have been known to occur. The worker is much smaller than either the queen or the drone. It is furnished with a tongue or proboscis of the most curious and complicated structure, which, when not in use, is nicely folded under its abdomen. With this, it licks or brushes up the honey, which is thence conveyed to its honey bag. This receptacle is not larger than a very small pea and is so perfectly transparent as to appear when filled of the same color with its contents. It is properly the first stomach of the bee, and is surrounded by muscles which enable the bee to compress it and empty its contents through her proboscis into the cells. The hinder legs of the worker are furnished with a spoon-shaped hollow or basket to receive the pollen or bee bread, which she gathers from the flowers. Every worker is armed with a formidable sting, and when provoked, makes instant and effectual use of her natural weapon. The sting, when subjected to microscopic examination, exhibits a very curious and complicated mechanism. It is moved by muscles which, though invisible to the eye, are yet strong enough to force the sting to the depth of one twelfth of an inch through the thick skin of a man's hand. At its root are situated two glands by which the poison is secreted. These glands uniting in one duct eject the venomous liquid along the groove formed by the junction of the two piercers. There are four barbs on the outside of each piercer. When the insect is prepared to sting, one of these piercers, having its point a little longer than the other, first darts into the flesh, and being fixed by its foremost barred, the other strikes in also, and they alternately penetrate deeper and deeper, till they acquire a firm hold of the flesh with their barbed hooks, and then follows the sheath containing the poison into the wound. The action of the sting, says Paley, affords an example of the union of chemistry and mechanism, of chemistry in respect to the venom, which can produce such powerful effects, of mechanism as the sting is a compound instrument. The machinery would have been comparatively useless had it not been for the chemical process by which in the insect's body honey is converted into poison, and on the other hand, the poison would have been ineffectual without an instrument to wound and a syringe to inject it. 
Upon examining the edge of a very keen razor by the microscope, it appears as broad as the back of a pretty thick knife, rough, uneven, and full of notches and furrows, and so far from anything like sharpness that an instrument as blunt as this seemed to be would not serve even to cleave wood. An exceedingly small needle being also examined, it resembled a rough iron bar out of a smith's forge. The sting of a bee, viewed through the same instrument, showed everywhere a polish amazingly beautiful, without the least flaw, blemish, or inequality, and ended in a point too fine to be discerned. The extremity of the sting being barbed like an arrow, the bee can seldom withdraw it, if the substance into which she darts it is at all tenacious. In losing her sting, she parts with a portion of her intestines, and of necessity soon perishes. As the loss of the sting is always fatal to the bees, they pay a dear penalty for the exercise of their patriotic instincts, but they always seem ready, except when they have taken a drop too much and are gorged with honey, to die in defense of their home and treasures. Hornets, wasps, and other stinging insects are able to withdraw their stings from the wound. I have never seen any attempt to account for the exception in the case of the honeybee. But if the Creator intended the bee for the use of man, as he most certainly did, has he not given it this peculiarity to make it less formidable, and therefore more completely subject to human control? Without a sting, it would have stood no chance of defending its tempting sweets against a host of greedy depredators. But if it could sting a number of times, it would be much more difficult to bring it into a state of thorough domestication. A quiver full of arrows in the hand of a skillful marksman is far more to be dreaded than a single shaft. The defense of the colony against enemies, the construction of the cells, the storing of them with honey and bee bread, the rearing of the young, in short, the whole work of the hive, the laying of eggs accepted, is carried on by the industrious little workers. There may be gentlemen of leisure in the commonwealth of bees, but most assuredly there are no such ladies, whether of high or low degree. The queen herself has her full share of duties, for it must be admitted that the royal office is no sinecure, when the mother who fills it must superintend daily the proper deposition of several thousand eggs. Age of Bees The queen bee, as has been already stated, will live four, and sometimes, though very rarely, five years. As the life of the drones is usually cut short by violence, it is not easy to ascertain its precise limit. Bevan, in some interesting statements on the longevity of bees, estimates it not to exceed four months. The workers are supposed by him to live six or seven months. Their age depends, however, very much upon their greater or less exposure to injurious influences and severe labors. Those reared in the spring and early part of summer, and on whom the heaviest labors of the hive must necessarily devolve, do not appear to live more than two or three months, while those which are bred at the close of summer and early in autumn, being able to spend a large part of their time in repose, attain a much greater age. It is very evident that the bee, to use the words of a quaint old writer, is a summer bird, and that with the exception of the queen, none live to be a year old. 
notched and ragged wings, instead of gray hairs and wrinkled faces, are the signs of old age in the bee and indicate that its season of toil will soon be over. They appear to die rather suddenly and often spend their last days and sometimes even their last hours in useful labors. Place yourself before a hive and see the indefatigable energy of these aged veterans, toiling along with their heavy burdens, side by side with their more youthful compeers, and then say, if you can, that you have done work enough, and that you will give yourself up to slothful indulgence, while the ability for useful labor still remains. Let the cheerful hum of their industrious old age inspire you with better resolutions and teach you how much nobler it is to meet death in the path of duty, striving still, as you have opportunity, to do good unto all men. The age which individual members of the community may attain must not be confounded with that of the colony, Bees have been known to occupy the same domicile for a great number of years. I have seen flourishing colonies which were twenty years old, and the Abbe de la Roca speaks of some over forty years old. Such cases have led to the erroneous opinion that bees are a long-lived race. But this, as Dr. Evans has observed, is just as wise as if a stranger contemplating a populous city and personally unacquainted with its inhabitants, should on paying it a second visit many years afterwards and finding it equally populous, imagine that it was peopled by the same individuals, not one of whom might then be living. Like leaves on trees, the race of bees is found, now green in youth, now withering on the ground. Another race the spring or fall supplies. They droop successive and successive rise. The cocoons spun by the larvae are never removed by the bees. They stick so closely to the sides of the cells that the knowing bee well understands that the labor of removal would cost more than it would be worth. In process of time, the breeding cells become too small for the proper development of the young. In some cases, the bees must take down and reconstruct the old combs, for if they did not, the young issuing from them would always be dwarfs, whereas I once compared with other bees, those of a colony more than 15 years old, and found no perceptible difference. That they do not always renew the old combs must be admitted, as the young from some old hives are often considerably below the average size. On this account, it is very desirable to be able to remove the old combs occasionally, that their place may be supplied with new ones. It is a great mistake to imagine that the brood combs ought to be changed every year, in my hives, they might, if it were desirable, be easily changed several times in a year, but once in five or six years is often enough. Oftener than this requires a needless consumption of honey to replace them, besides being for other reasons undesirable, as the bees are always in winter, colder in new comb than in old. Inventors of hives have too often been, most emphatically, men of one idea, and that one, instead of being a well-established and important fact in the physiology of the bee, has frequently, like the necessity for a yearly change of the brood combs, been merely a conceit, existing nowhere but in the brain of a visionary projector. This is all harmless enough, until an effort is made to impose such miserable crudities upon an ignorant public, either in the shape of a patented hive, or worse still, of an unpatented hive, 
the pretended right to use, which is fraudulently sold to the cheated purchaser. For want of proper knowledge with regard to the age of bees, huge bee palaces and large closets in garrets or attics have been constructed, and their proprietors have vainly imagined that the bees would fill them, however roomy, for they can see no reason why a colony should not continue to increase indefinitely, until at length it numbers its inhabitants by millions or billions. As the bees can never at one time equal, still less exceed the number which the queen is capable of producing in one season, these spacious dwellings have always an abundance of spare rooms. It seems strange that men can be thus deceived, when often in their own apiary they have healthy stocks which have not swarmed for a year or more, and which yet in the spring are not a whit more populous than those which have regularly parted with vigorous swarms. It is certain that the Creator has, for some wise reason, set a limit to the increase of numbers in a single colony and I shall venture to assign what appears to me to have been one reason for his so doing. Suppose that he had given to the bee a length of life as great as that of the horse or the cow, and had made each queen capable of laying daily some hundreds of thousands of eggs, or had given several hundred queens to each hive, then from the very nature of the case, a colony must have gone on increasing until it became a scourge rather than a benefit to man. In the warm climates of which the bee is a native, they would have established themselves in some cavern or capacious cleft in the rocks, and would there have quickly become so powerful as to bid defiance to all attempts to appropriate the avails of their labors. It has already been stated that none except the mother wasps and hornets survive the winter. If these insects had been able, like the bee, to commence the season with the accumulated strength of a large colony, long before its close, they would have proved a most intolerable nuisance. If, on the contrary, the queen bee had been compelled, solitary and alone, to lay the foundations of a new commonwealth, the honey harvest would have disappeared before she could have become the parent of a numerous family. In the laws which regulate the increase of bees, as well as in all other parts of their economy, we have the plainest proofs that the insect was formed for the special service of the human race. And on that rather self-serving platitude, I think we'll end this evening's reading from The Hive and the Honey Bee, a beekeeper's manual, written by a man known as the father of modern beekeeping, the Reverend L. L. Langstroth. And despite all the moralizing, I must say, most of the information provided by the good Reverend is still considered pretty correct which is saying something for a book that's 170 years old. If you'd like to read this useful work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect, suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, or request more from one we've already started, you can drop me an email via our website, www. Dot boringbookspod.com. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night. <laughs>